Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. <clears throat> Boy, it's a beautiful view out these windows. I'm going to say, you know, 21 knots or so of breeze out there. You can't always get a, uh, a speaking program right next to beautiful windows with 21 knots of sailing breeze, but such is the life at the St. Francis Yacht Club. Let's see a little bit about future speakers. Uh, in September, we'll have Daniel Forrester come and talk all about beauty is in the heart of the beast. He is a renowned photographer, and he'll be here for the Big Boat series. He will make the case that he has the greatest life on Earth. As he puts it, he flies into exotic locations, takes pictures of beautiful pieces of art, sailing with the breeze out on the ocean, and he gets paid for it. Uh, you want to come uh, a, a week, a month, or a week earlier, September the fifth. Rich Jeppesen will make a similar claim. He will talk about making a living doing what you love, he, and growing the world of sailing clubs. He is the founder of Olympic Circle Sailing Club, a very successful business for more than thirty years. He'll make the case that they are changing the world of sailing by introducing people who otherwise couldn't have boats to the fraternity and the fun and the echo awareness of the world of sailing. Uh, in the late August, come by to hear Chris Walsh talk about underwater munitions. In fact, most people don't realize that when a bomber returns from its base, if it's um, that's very, very dangerous to land with those munitions, and they, as a regular course, drop their armaments in a body of water, usually a lake or a bay, as they are about to land. It's incredible to know that this, that big munitions deposits are under the water off the coast of California and, in fact, um, New Jersey and other parts of the United States. There's several thousand of these depositories, and Chris Welch is an authority on the whole subject, and he'll talk all about a new international efforts to clean up these uh, burial grounds for eroding munitions. Um, in the middle of August, on the 15th, Joe Pratt will be here to talk the operation of zero emission marine vessels. He's the CEO of Golden Gate Zero Emissions, and he will say just as uh, hybrid vehicles are, um, you know, growing in popularity on land. The same thing is happening in the ocean, and there are increasing examples of zero emission vessels. And on August the 8th, the uh, noted, famed, really, naturalist Michael Ellis will be here to talk about um, Africa, his favorite continent, and specifically uh, the Serengeti, where he will make the case that a million animals at a time can uh, inherit, inhabit the Serengeti and go through this incredible you know, change of life uh, seasonally that's pretty spectacular. Uh, August the 1st, Christine Prakas. She is a boat captain, navigator, lawyer, business executive, and executive coach. She has a social media following, and she travels around in her beautiful yacht. And all of a sudden, that that world was interrupted with back-to-back -back Irma and Maria uh, hurricanes. She'll talk about surviving, weathering, as it were, uh, Maria and Irma, these back-to-back um, hurricanes. And next week, uh, you'll hear Brendan Southall talk about the environmentally responsible business decisions that have led us all to realize that there is danger in too much sound in the ocean. So he's an authority on sound in the ocean. You don't realize it, but when a liner goes by, those liners uh, give off, you know, 160, 70 um, decibels of sound and they're uh, changing the navigational patterns and the breeding patterns and in fact the life of sea animals all of which is um, uh, the, his subject of study so we have great speakers thus coming up a little bit about our speaker today what makes a great yacht club well the St. Francis we, at St. Franny we would argue that 39 regattas a year, that helps a lot. A beautiful location, uh, rapid access to you know, harbor and boats, those are all great. Others of us would argue, yes, that's great, but what really makes a yacht club are the members. We have 2,400 incredibly talented members, one of whom is our speaker today. If you walk around this beautiful clubhouse, you'll see 39 photographs, really beautiful, artsy, great 
uh, photographs of sailing activity, kiteboarding activity, powerboating activity, yacht club activity. And of that, those 30, 39, 32 of those photographs were taken by our speaker today. An incredible um, value to our yacht club and um, frequent adventurer in the world who comes back with his great slideshows, this one on Africa. Please welcome Chris Ray. Chris. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, one and all. I guess this is my sixth or seventh time uh, addressing this august body, so thanks for having me back and putting up with me. So let's get, uh, without further ado, on to our topic for today, which is Africa, the dark continent. Quite possibly where most of our ancestors in this room are from. How many of you have been there? How many more than once? Turns out Kim and I have been 14 times, we think. We've actually lost count. I have a lot of slides to get through today, uh, mostly because I can't pick between my photos. They're like my kids. Don't ask me to choose. Africa's a feast for the senses. So let's begin with some of the sounds of the night. These are male lions. This sound can carry 10 miles or more. So these guys are a long ways away. These guys, on the other hand, they're really close. As often happens, this is a very male-dominated society, and when one starts squawking, others want to let them know that they're around too and there might be a fight to be had. More on that later. These are dawn sounds. I'm not a birder, but Africa may have made me one. These sounds are from Botswana, specifically the Okavango Delta, one of a number of unique landscapes that Africa has to offer. After a night with the lion sounds, these birds are announcing, I made it, I'm still here. The crack of dawn is a veritable symphony. When Kim and I were dating, low those 30 years or so ago now. We found that we love traveling together, which is a very strong early indicator that you're compatible. If you can travel with someone, that means a lot. But I digress. Back then, I had a startup company, and she was opening international markets for Sun Microsystems. We could share expenses, and I could call on customers that I could never have economically uh, justified otherwise. So we find ourselves in Johannesburg, South Africa, which is right in the middle of this map, with a weekend to kill. What to do? A Sun colleague suggested a safari, and the rest is, as they say, history. We hopped a South African airline flight to a place called Gakuza. Joe Berg is here with a little blue arrow pointing up at it on the left of your screen, and Gakuza is that little red dot and they call it an aerodrome in this uh, satellite view, but it's more like a, a grass strip next to the Kruger National Park. When you get there, there's a bunch of open-top vehicles like this uh, waiting for the, from the various lodges to pick up their guests for the weekend. We arrive in our street clothes from Joburg with a box camera and they whisk us off to a place called Mala Mala, one of the many lodges served by the Kikuza Airport. Normally, we like to see a room before we accept it. Kim likes to look at more than one room for certain. But in this case, the front desk says, if you hurry, you're just in time for the afternoon Gabe drive. They're waiting for you. So don't forget the, sun the sunblock, some mosquito spray, and some layers, because it can get cold later. A quick bathroom break, and we're off in our street clothes. Same open-top Land Rover. So here's what we see first. One of the oddest yet most wonderful creatures on this planet of ours. Indescribable. Truly a marvelous creature. The way they move is so majestic. With a neck like this, getting a drink can be something of a problem. So... 
Hold still, Mom. <laughs> this is the next fellow we ran into. Interesting sounds these guys make. This is a matriarchal society from grandmas all the way down to little ones. They communicate like this. A fair amount of this vocalizing is too low for us to even hear. And what we do hear, we don't understand. I have not included what they sound like mad. That's not only very clear, but a bit terrifying, and I thought I'd spare you. You'd only hear it if you got too close. Next, we drive into a herd of these guys all around us, hundreds of them. These are Cape buffalo, and they look and act like cows, but they are very dangerous. Aggressive and hostile, you are in real trouble if you're this close and on foot. The old males, like this guy, don't see or hear very well anymore, and they are always very grumpy, kind of like me. We've been on this game drive all of 30 minutes, and we've already seen two of the big five, and it gets better. Next, we drive by a largest watering hole, and we see these guys, hippos. This is a harem society. The biggest, toughest male gets all the girls. Pre-adolescent boys get run off before they start causing problems. And these guys graze on grass all night long and return to the riverbed during the day to keep their skin out of the sun. This is the most deadly animal in Africa. More people get killed by this guy than any other animal in Africa. Because if you were to find yourself between them and their home in the riverbed, you're in big, big trouble. This is the last really big animal in the big five. We didn't see any rhinos in Mala Mala because they're poached for their horns, which consists of uh, keratin. It's the same stuff our hair and fingernails are made of. Prized by Arab princes for dagger scabbards and oriental or for aphrodisiacs, rhinos are seriously endangered. This is a white rhino. Anybody here? Able to tell me why? Well, this is a black rhino, and you'll notice that his lips are somewhat pointed at the end of his mouth. He's a browser. He eats uh, small leaves off of trees and low-lying bushes. This guy is a white rhino, or more accurately, in the Afrikaans, a white rhino, by which they mean wide-mouthed rhino. He's a grazer and uh, eats grasses and, uh, and things off the ground. These guys go 5,000 pounds easy, and there's something like 20,000 of them left in the world. During the first few hours, we also seen various antelopes like kudu, this one with the twisty horns, niala, waterbuck, red lechwe, oryx, this is a desert antelope, Sable, which is a gorgeous animal. This fellow is a, this is a male impala. This is a harem society. This guy runs off all the smaller males, and they have to congregate in their own bachelor herds. So here's a very typical scene. Around a water hole, all the girls are having their, getting their drinks along with the kids. And there in the middle background is the guy standing watch on the, on the whole thing, keeping an eye on, uh, on, you know, A, dangerous predators, and B, rivals. So this is an interesting group. You can see by the ears and by the elongated noses that they have very acute senses. But their main sense for predator awareness is their eyesight. And if you look at this flock from left to right, You'll see that their heads are pointed in every possible direction, keeping a really sharp lookout for uh, anything untoward that might be creeping up toward them in the low-lying brush here. And this is what happens if somebody were to hear a twig snap. They are all gone in a flash. This is a very cute antelope called a clip springer. He's a cliff dweller. He has a mate. You'll never see the two of them together because one is always hiding, probably with their offspring. 
This is the same idea. This one is a, a blue diker, and he's a forest dweller, but the same idea. He pairs up for life, and he and his mate will be nearby each other, but never would you be able to see two of them at the same time. This is a little fellow we nicknamed a, little, a, a baby rhino. This is one of the prey animals' favorite, uh, the pred predator animals' favorite meals. This is a, uh, a warthog. Now, those tusks are razor sharp, so you don't want to be anywhere near the business end. This is a banded mongoose. These are meerkats, which are cousins of our prairie dogs, which we find in the southwest here in the United States. Very cute colonies, so there'd be a whole mob of these guys. This is quite a rare animal called an aardvark. Seeing one during daylight hours is a really uh, exceptional uh, thing. Um, you can see by the ears and the nose here, his eyesight is not particularly good, but this guy is a sense of smell and his sense of hearing are so acute that he is able to consume something like 60,000 ants in an evening. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of ants you've got to find. This guy's even rarer. This is a pangolin or a spiny anteater. Those are bony plates. He's, this is a, literally a prehistoric animal. And uh, if he's threatened, he rolls up in a ball. He looks like a soccer ball. This is a real troublemaker. This is a baboon along with her offspring uh, catching a ride. Um, I should mention now that a number of the animals I've just shown you are really rare, and we did not see all of these at Mala Mala. Here's a group of zebra. Now, we're still in southern Africa, which you can tell by the, uh, the, look, the trees here in the, in the direct background. But it's interesting when you look at a zebra that it's hard to tell when one starts and the next one stops. And that's a big part of their defense mechanisms. Uh, the predators who prey on these need to pick one because this guy can run like a horse and be gone. And most of the big predators can do a 50 to 100 and yard dash, but that's all. And so you have to pick the right one to start with, or your hunt will be unsuccessful. This camouflage pattern makes it difficult to pick one from another. Here's what the alarm sound for a zebra sounds like. This is some predator or something untoward going on nearby. It's odd that a horse-like creature could make a noise like that. Right, now I'm shifting focus to Eastern Africa. You would not see a crowd this large, typically, in Southern Africa. But uh, you'll see some other differences here in a minute as well. These are wildebeest. You see them often. They will gather in, in groups like this. And here is a, quite a typical scene in uh, Eastern Africa. This happens to be the Serengeti. And... If you're in the right place in Eastern Africa, there's a million animals in sight. If you're in the wrong place in Africa, there'll just be a couple of birds and, uh, and, and maybe one beast, but uh, you'd be looking at an empty field here. These animals follow the rains, and they have a roughly 2,000-mile loop that they track on year in and year out, uh, have, giving birth on the on the walk, and they are always looking for fresh grasses. And so, when it rains a little bit different, then they head over there and eat the grass that grows after the rain's been there. This is the Mara River, and if you're lucky, if you go to the Mara, you can sometimes see them cross. They'll come to the river's edge. Sometimes they don't, but sometimes they do. They're driven instinctually to chase the rain and the grasses. So sometimes you'll get a handful like this. And sometimes you'll get a thousand beasts in the water, which is what we're seeing here. It's really a crazy looking thing, and there's no telling whether they'll do it or not. This takes us to our first predator. 
This is a Nile crocodile. It's a cold-blooded animal. Their metabolism changes with the weather. If it's cold, they shut down. If it's warm, they don't. This is an animal that gets to be 20 feet long and 2,000 pounds, and they can do that with one meal a year, which is an incredible thing if you think about it. Here in the Mara River, if you look right in the middle of the lower part of this picture, right in the center, there is a Nile crocodile who's planning to make a meal out of one of these wildebeests that's making the crossing. In this particular case, the wildebeest made it to the bank and the croc was unable to hold on. In this case, the wildebeest didn't make it and now you've seen a kill. So on to the other predators. This is a male lion. We were listening to somebody, one of his brothers earlier in the talk. You look at this guy's face. This is another one. You've got that big cut on the nose and there's a bunch of scars all over his face, um, which speak of a lifetime of fighting over food and girls. So what's new? These guys have a great life from age eight to a little bit after their 10th birthday when they reach their physical peaks. They're very social, very territorial, and very hierarchical. A coalition of related males, probably half-brothers, will gang up and run, any, run off anybody who's too old to fight for their territory. The marks on these guys' faces tell of a lifetime of tussling over food and girls. This is a 20-year-old video clip of a lion that, uh, that I saw in a place in southern Africa. Look how close we are. That's a 600-pound beast if he was a penny. And he'd just as soon make a meal out of you as look at you if you were on foot. But when you're in one of these open vehicles, they see you as part of the vehicle. And for some reason... These predators assess the amount of energy required to get a meal and make the decision, the conscious decision, not to come after us. In large part because somehow they instinctually know that if they get injured doing something, they're facing a long, slow death from starvation. So they actively assess whether it's worth the trouble. And something as big as a vehicle is too big for them to tackle. Now, this is a big lioness. The girls in this society do the hunting and the killing, and then the pride males show up for first dibs on the food. Dining etiquette in lion society is non-existent. You always have to fight for your place at the table. And when you're too old or weak to get your place at the table, you're looking at dying of starvation. It's all good if you can defend your territory, but if and when you can't, the new boys come in, Kill all the cubs, the lionesses all immediately go into heat, and there'll be a brand new pride in a matter of weeks. This old gal has lost a, a big part of that canine tooth uh, fighting over food, probably. Once they've fed, lions will sleep 20 hours a day. They have incredible eyesight, and they can virtually see in the dark, which gives them a real over advantage over most of their prey. And once they start to look around and stir, this often ensues. So the girls are off on a hunt looking for tonight's dinner, and this often follows that. If you look in the right foreground, you'll see what's left of this antelope's antler, and you've got no fewer than five big females ch um, chowing away on tonight's dinner here. Here we have the last of the big five. This is a female leopard lounging high in the safety of a tree, far from most of her worries. Leopards, unlike lions, are very solitary beings. Mating's a very dangerous business. She'll bear the cubs, put up with them until they can care for themselves, and suddenly she'll run them off and they'll have to find their own territory and fend for themselves. 
These are ambush predators, and most of their prey will never know what hit them. This one's given us the hairy eyeball, but she'll drop out of that tree onto an antelope and never know what hit them. Once again, here's a predator that if they don't kill, they don't eat, and if they don't eat, they starve. It's a tough life. Now, here's a really big male who's literally licking his wounds. He's just been a really nasty scrap with somebody possibly bigger and tougher than he is. If you look at his ear that's closest to our thing, a big, a big chunk's been taken out of that. He's got a, a pretty good-sized wound over his eye there and another couple right on his nose. And there's, he's still bleeding from his nose. And his tongue has been split. Imagine what would have had to happen to have that go on. Here's a young male trying his luck. Now, these guys start trying, their, uh, trying out their chops uh, early on in life. And being an ambush predator, they have to get really good at this. Uh, these warthogs didn't see him until they got really close. The guides were saying that this guy wasn't really serious, that he'd never actually tried to take down one of these. He was still just trying out the working up close to them. So back to Mala Mala for a second. That first game drive, we saw two female lions take down a warthog right in front of us. Incredible luck for us. Some people go for years and never see a kill. That evening, we were sharing our guide and a driver with a British couple who had been coming to Mala Mala for years and had never seen a kill up close like that. We'd been in the bush three hours just proving that dumb luck is the very best kind. Well, this is a cheetah. This is the smallest of the big cats, fast. They don't have the night vision that the other cats have. So they have to do their killing during the day, and they're eating. As the smallest, they have to eat fast before something bigger comes along and takes their meal. So they gorge. Often... One will keep guard while the others are laying around sleeping, but always one of them's always got a head up and keeping their eye out for either the next meal or for the competition. Unlike us, when you see a cat yawn like this, they're getting up, they're getting ready to go hunting. When we yawn, we're going to bed. This is a, an old female uh, I don't know if you can really tell by the coloring around her, but it's quite late in the dusky evening, and so she's probably looking for her safe place because uh, her eyesight is not going to allow her to find something to eat tonight. And you can see how lean she's gotten. This was an old gal, and we don't know whether she's going to survive because uh, she needs to kill and eat pretty quickly now. 20 years ago, just to show dumb luck again, this is three brothers in the Masimara, which you can tell by the green grass all around them. They are, I happened to catch the cheetah signature move here. The rightmost of them has his right paw out, as you can, if you look closely. And what they do is get their prey running as fast as they can. And these guys can do 70 miles an hour. He reaches out and clips that rear heel, gets him to cross his legs, and the prey is down in a, in a heap, and they pounce. It just happened to be dumb luck that I caught this. Didn't really know what I was looking at at the time. The other thing that's interesting about this shot is that while you just see them in the foreground, all around them the migration is going on at a respectful distance. These guys are one of the reasons why the cheetah has to eat so fast. This is another matriarchal society way closer to cats than dogs, despite their, their appearance. It's a very social animal with unbelievable senses of hearing and smell. They can sense a kill miles away. So they smell the blood or hear the sounds of the death throes of an animal that's being taken by another predator. And these vocalizations we're listening to are communicating to the rest of their group 
about the distance to and the direction to wherever this happening is, and they will go congregate uh, there and make life difficult for whatever animal has taken something. These guys like to come in and steal meals. They have a rolling gait and can run for hours. They'll often run down prey by giving slow chase until the animal collapses from exhaustion. And they have one of the strongest jaws in the animal kingdom. These guys crush bone like nothing, so there's often very little left for the vultures to finish. This is a black-backed jackal. And these are wild dogs. Wild dogs are becoming quite rare in Africa as well. These are another animal which uh, run down their prey. Uh, these guys run down in tag teams like relays. Just the one will get tired and lay down, and his buddy will keep up the chase, keeping the prey moving until the prey collapses from exhaustion. Then all these guys show up, and it's bad news for the prey animal. This cute little fellow is a cousin of our wolverine. This is a honey badger and one of the meanest guys in the neighborhood. He's cute, but you want to give this guy a really wide berth because he's just as mean as they come. This guy's got sand all over his face because we've just watched him chase a snake down into its burrow grabbed the snake, dragged him out of the burrow, and ate him head first right in front of us. Like I say, this isn't somebody you want to mess with. So at this point, it's time to shift gears a little bit and talk about accommodations. As with travel to anywhere, the devil is in the details. Planning is everything, and here's where you might be staying if you don't do your homework. On the other hand, this is also a tent. This happens to be Zarafa in Botswana. But this is the, my kind of tent, overstuffed leather chairs, writing desk, framed artwork on the walls, mini bar, lovely accommodations. And this is where Zarafa is, just to the north of the Okavanga Delta, an absolutely lovely, lovely place. This is another a place in Botswana, the Okavanga Delta, which is interesting because there's lots of water around because after the rainy season has been in Botswana and Angola, the water runs downhill from Angola into Botswana. So you're looking at 12 to possibly 30 inches of water on the ground, but it's very dry in every other way. There's not much insect, but quite a bit of bird life. So it's a great place to be in the right times of year. You can get an idea of what the accommodations here are. Very modern plumbing, absolutely top-rate place, mini bar, coffee maker. There's a little refrigerator in behind those doors. That's a really nice place, and that's where that is. Here's a little different landscape. If you were to go to Namibia, which is a desert country, you get a very different landscape. Not quite so much wildlife, but uh, a whole nother perspective on Africa, and that's where that is in Namibia. That was Little Koala Camp. And one of our favorite places where we'd move in if we had the option is a place called Singita. Now, this is uh, next to the Kruger National Park um, in southeastern Africa. This uh, is a little bit of a misleading photograph in that our plunge pool has quite a precipitous drop right past it, which you can't see. So those elephants that are uh, meandering through the Sand River uh, there are a lot farther away than they look in this picture. This is a really gorgeous, gorgeous property, and uh, you kind of get a sense of the modern plumbing and the, the floor-to-ceiling glass windows, and that's a lovely, lovely property. And that's where Singita is. Now, shifting gears, this is another Singita property, but we're now in Tanzania, which is eastern Africa. This is on the border of, the, uh, of Kenya, uh, where the Serengeti and the Masamara meet. This is your room at Sasasqua. We're getting the idea, I think. The library in your room. Pretty nice digs. 
They have a tented camp, which is not far, and you get a sense of what's going on here, oriental carpets on the floors and my cameras in the immediate foreground. Um, nice digs, nice digs. Uh, modern plumbing, et cetera, et cetera. Remember, this is a tent. Right down to the Wedgwood Crystal, uh, they take pretty good care of you. That's where that is. So let's go back to the story about the migration. If you're in the right place, you'll see a million animals. If you're in the wrong place, there isn't an animal in sight. So how do you plan when no one knows where the animals will be next week? How do you plan three, six, 12 months in advance? Well, there's two approaches. One, you can take a, a risk and book a lodge that you hope they'll be near, but you could spend a week at a lodge without a single animal. Or you can track down a mobile tented camp. That's what this is. These guys literally pack up everything and move once a week to follow the migration, so you're always close. Now, these guys had oriental carpets on the floors, and they had a wonderful kitchen set up where they actually made us cheese souffle for dinner one night. So these guys really know what they're doing, and they take great care of you. But Kim had done her homework on this, but she didn't ask me a critical question, which was, do you know what a long drop loo is? This little wooden box is sitting over a dirt hole in the ground. And that little wicker basket that's sitting there with the little piece of handle coming out of it, that's a scoop. So when the guide, Richard, who was a delightful guy and we'd been with for several days, delivered us to this camp about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and starts going through the how you use the, the facilities in this particular place, and he's gone through how the local lake they pull out 55-gallon drums of and, and get the water hot. So at 5 o'clock in the morning in the dark, you know, they wake you up and they put this hot water in a dump that's above the shower, and you pull the chain to get wet, soap up, and then pull the chain with the rest of the water to rinse off. She got through that fine, but when he shows her the box and how you put dirt on your business when you're finished. She did a 180 and came marching out of the little bathroom here with tears streaming down her cheeks going, I worked too hard to live like this. But, you know, and I'll... So <laughs> Richard has seen this happen before. And so now we get a little lesson in African psychology. Richard says, there is a lodge nearby. I don't know if they have any space available, but I can take you there right now, or if you think you can get through the night, um, I'll take you there in the morning, and you can have a look, and we can find out if they have room and all that sort of thing. So Kim is mollified somewhat by this. We go out and sit at this little table where you can see her back to us. I grab that chair and drag it over to the table, at which point a lovely bottle of South African Sauvignon Blanc shows up, and we had been together about 10 years by the time we visited this place, and so we start drinking a little wine, and one thing leads to another. We start giggling and thinking about some of the other crazy adventures and all of the travels around the world we'd already had up to date, and we've had plenty of things happen while we're traveling, and stuff happens. And so we start giggling about that, and right about that time, and I'm thinking it's about 5 o'clock in the evening, uh, four more guests arrive at the camp, and they're staying in the tents that are adjacent to ours down the way. We're camp tent one and closest to the, to the camp, but, uh, you know, the next couple of tents down, those people go into those tents. Not thinking much about that. We ran into one of those couples again, Ten days later in another one of these wonderful camps, and my wife and the, uh, the missus in that group uh, got to talking, and she said, well, what would you think of the long drop loo? At which point Kim goes, I couldn't believe that. I didn't, didn't want to stay, blah, 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 blah. And she said, well, that's really odd that you would say that because we walked by you, and with the two of you giggling, we thought you thought it was fine. And we said to ourselves, if they can take it, we can take it. A little lesson in African psychology. 
So the other thing about these trips is if they told you on the front end that you're going to wake you up before dawn, feed you a coffee and a biscuit, toss you in an open vehicle and bounce you around dusty roads for three and a half, four hours, bring you back, feed you a wonderful lunch with wine, etc., 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 you take a nap and all the rest of that, and then around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, bundle you back into that vehicle and bounce around dusty roads for another three, three and a half hours, and you were going to do this day after day after day, uh, you would start to wonder whether we'd lost our senses. But frankly, I can't wait to go back. It's that much fun. But you do have to plan a vacation from your vacation. And this is one of our favorite places to have a vacation after our vacation, a place called the Ellerman House in Cape Town. And this is the view from your room in Bantry Bay, Cape Town. It's an absolutely glorious place. The wine country is a half an hour to 45 minutes away, and this is a really special place. This is what the satellite view of that location looks like. So having said that, this is the wrap-up. I have two little uh, clips I want to take you through, with apologies to uh, Out of Africa's director and the, the stars in this. Um, I've seen this movie only a thousand or so times, and I never get tired of this. It always chokes me up. This is wonderful music, and this is, happens to be Eastern Africa that they're flying through, but the scenery is every bit this breathtaking. And I thought I'd include it because video does say some things that stills won't. This is a little part of the Rift Valley, which travels quite a ways north-south in uh, Kenya and Tanzania, and it is a absolutely glorious, glorious place to be. And this is what the migration looks like from the air. You can literally see that you have thousands and upon thousands of animals, something moving everywhere that you can see. It really is that beautiful. And like I say, Kim and I can't wait to go back. These are flamingos. And they get that funny pink color because they eat a small crustacean, which is that color. And now I'll leave you with my last little bit. This uh, little serenade is uh, Lady Smith Black Mombasa. Well, hopefully I've communicated a little bit about what makes Africa so special to Kim and I. Thank you for your kind attention. Well, Chris, uh, welcome to, to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. Our guest today is Chris Ray, a noted photographer around our club and parts beyond. 
And he's here to speak about the incredible, beautiful scenery of Africa, where he and his wife Kim have had 14 beautiful trips. So Chris, talk to me. When you go to Africa, what's your ideal length of time? And do you call the whole thing a safari? Distinguish the trip and the safari. Well, great question. Uh, Kim and I want to make sure that we leave a place before we're ready to rather than after. In others, I'm not ready to go yet, as opposed to, oh, God, we got another day here. So we find that these lovely safari camps are probably good for at least two nights, if not three. Three's a little more relaxed. You get a better sense of the stuff that's going on. And we'll usually chain three or four of these together, changing... Um, venues enough so that you get different landscape because you do tend to get the same um, topography if you stay close. So we might go to Botswana and see the Okavanga Delta. We might go to Namibia and have the desert. We might go to Southern Africa and have the uh, have the different landscapes that you get for those different uh, places. So uh, from San Francisco, and remembering we lived in London for a couple of years, and so this was an eight-hour trip instead of a two-day trip, which it is from the West Coast. But uh, so three weeks is probably what you're going to need if you want to have a vacation from your vacation, which I think is a great idea, trying to come straight home from the safari experiences. You're going to find you're really, really tired if you do that. Just one more logistical question. So what's the routing you like from from California? Uh, we've done it a, a number of ways. Probably the most painless is a San Francisco-London and then London to either Joburg or South or uh, Cape Town, and that works particularly well because you arrive in London early enough to take the the uh, Heathrow Express into town, get a great lunch in you, and then turn around and go back. And the the, uh, the Heathrow Express, in their infinite wisdom, has a a deal for doing an inside twelve hour turnaround, and that beats the heck out of trying to stay in the airport all day. Um, and you know you you get uh, get some sun in your face and start your process of uh, of of getting over the that uh, from west to east jet lag, which is murder. Mm -hmm. So when you land, um, how long are you? What's the process of getting connected up to your guide and all that? Is that a day process? What, what's and, and how do you pick the guides? Talk a little bit about... Get, uh, Kim is better to answer that, and unfortunately she couldn't be here for this one, but uh, the camps, um, y you set up a, the time and such, and you set up your arrangement on how you're going to get to the camp. Um, and then they, typically your guide will pick you up from the airstrip. Uh, a lot of these camps have their own little airstrips, or the airstrips are quite close. And so you start out with the same guide and, and tracker uh, from the beginning. And, and that is uh, how Southern Africa tends to work. Eastern Africa, um, I mentioned Richard. Uh, we found Richard. Uh, he picked us up in um, Arusha, which is one of the main airports that you'd fly into in Eastern Africa. And Richard drove us all over the place. And, and finally dropped us off at the end. I think we were with him for seven days. Now, that, in that scenario, you'd need to find and interview the guy on the front end, tell him what you're expecting, and he can tell you what he can and can't deliver for you. Uh, so there's a little more vetting process involved with that. The interesting thing about these camps, be they East or Southern Africa, is that they're very often small family-run operations. So there's, it's quite an intimate atmosphere. Um, you didn't ask this, but I'm launching into another area. What has happened because of the... We, we've, we've had a, a change. You're starting to get the concept of ecotourism going on, where the local village people have been educated about how important keeping these predators alive is. In the old days, if a leopard took one of your cattle, uh, dad and maybe his brother would go out with a gun or a spear and kill a leopard. Now, they would make a claim. 
get paid for the, the head of cattle that had been killed, and they leave the leopard in place because the leopard draws us, which fills these camps and provides wonderful employment and educational opportunities for the village people. The kids are getting a great education because these people typically will hire a school teacher to come in and teach them the three R's. And mom gets a job as a cook or a maid or whatever it is that she's interested in doing and dad or uncle might become a guide or a driver or a tracker or a maintenance man or any of these other ancillary roles that these, because these are basically glorified farms, there's all this work that needs to be done on a farm and the local community benefits. We benefit because we get a chance to come and see these glorious animals in their natural habitat. And I, I can't see how everybody doesn't win in this situation. So on the subject again of the guides, how old are they? And what's the career path for a guide? Great question. So once this camp has established itself in this location, uh, the school age kids would go and learn, uh, you know, learn the three R's and be the education systems in most of these places are feeders. They, they don't have the same uh, uh, approach to education that we in America, if you don't get a college education in America, so they think you're missing something. Um, what these are, these and most of these are English um, inspired systems, they tend to bubble people up into areas of their interest and expertise, and then they take them down vocational tracks pretty quickly if they don't pass O and A level exams, which would um, cause them to be put on a university track. So somebody who had great eyesight and who loved the animals might get taken in a track that was down to, to going to guide school. And they do go to guide school and get certifications of all sorts about the animals, their behaviors. I mean... These guys um, from the local community can literally emulate the bird calls of the myriad birds that they come into contact with, and they could, their eyesight is so spectacular that they could tell you that that was a pale, chanting goshawk instead of a lesser goshawk, which is something they would know by having um, spotted the pants on the bird. <laughs> Just go, <laughs> it's incredible. But uh, And then somebody who was more inclined to be Mr. Fix-It might wind up being a mechanic of some kind or a carpenter or that sort of thing. And they tend to channel these guys into vocations that they're suited for. So, so what's the non-farm economy, a non-tourist economy for them? What does farming consist of? That's a, a very good question. Before ecotourism came, what, what was going on? Right. Um, in, these are very agrarian. There isn't. These are really hard places to farm. Um, there is a nor there's wonderful soil and wonderful climatic conditions for tobacco, and for a couple of other crops like that. But that's incredibly hard work. Typically, these uh, societies were um, more oriented toward uh, cattle and goats and that sort of stuff. So. The first tracker I met, and we're talking about uh, over 20 years ago, was a guy named Tiffany, and we asked him how it was that he had such excellent eyesight. And he said, my father would send me out with our seven or eight cows, and if I didn't come back with seven or eight cows, I was in for a beating because I was in charge of the family wealth, literally. So I had to spot that leopard before we got too close to her, and one of my cows became her meal. So I learned everything about what was going on around me so that I could you know, let the other animals and birds around me alert me to the presence of, of this sort of danger. So these guys are very tuned to their local stuff, and they know when something's off. It's, it's uh, really a remarkable. I suppose we know, you know, in uh, in uh, uh, youngster when something's not quite right or when a current has changed or something like that. These guys know their world very much the same way. 
so um, often I've said in talks about teamwork, I've said um, one of us gets eaten by the lion, uh, three of us defend against the lion, five of us, we go lion hunting. Well, that's, that's metaphorically what I've said many times. But what is it really like if you're in the Serengeti, if there just were two of you? I mean, if you got dropped in, I mean, literally, you know, two of one, people like us, how long would you last if you got dropped in the Serengeti? And let's imagine you had, you know, some kind of weaponry, guns and things like that. Would you last? Well, you can make weaponry, as it turns out. Uh, there's brush and, and uh, you know, f fire is uh, something these animals are all still scared of. Um, we could digress to the patent, uh, to the... Uh, to, to the patent joke about I only have to outrun you, but <laughs> <laughs> but, but literally there's, pretty a, fast, Chris. there's a whole there's a whole <laughs> protocol about if you were to confront find yourself uh, in a situation with lions particularly. Right, right. Um, this is this a similar behavior that you'd adopt if you were to uh, find yourself face to face with a Kodiak bear or any other. Um, apex predator that you might find worldwide. A, um, as it turns out, they don't really want to have anything to do with us. If we surprised them or got between them and their kids, okay, we're in, we're, they're going to fight to the death, so we're up a creek. Now it's time to climb a tree. But other than that, if we were to come into a clearing and see them at the bar, for instance, um, we'd stand still for a second and and gauge their um, behavior. I mean, if they they popped right up and started coming at us, well, now we're really in trouble. Find a tree. But if they don't, typically they would head up and look us over and try to assess the threat that we posed. Now, turning and running would be the f worst thing we could do because then we're prey immediately. We have announced that we're tasty and it's worth chasing us. But if we had just stood our ground eyeball them, maybe move sideways or back up slowly. Same thing if we ran into, if we came, uh, it, it's incredible that elephants are as quiet as they are given the size, but you can come on elephants if you're not careful. And, uh, you know, they're in any elephant herd, they're often little ones, and mom and grandma are not going to be pleased that you're too close. Once again, it's, uh, and you might get a mock charge out of one of these animals. So they might run at you for the first 10 feet and then stop and eyeball you again and, you know, give you the, are you still here? Look, <laughs> which point is, say, no, no, I get it. I'm out of here. Uh, but once again, we don't want to turn tail and run. We want to, you know, okay, you're a tough guy, but I'm a tough guy too. I'm going to cost you. If you want to take me, you're going to, it's going to cost you something. Um, in that case, they'll keep sizing you up, and at this point, you especially sidle off, um, and you've got a good chance. Or try and outrun me. <laughs> so uh, when you're in the when you're in the in the a jeep, a truck, a car, uh, the animal can see you and the car and think of you as a bigger animal because of that. Is they, that how you get close to them? I've been watching in your photos over trip and trip and trip. You frequently get really close to some of these animals. Well, there's a couple things going on there. One, uh, the magic of a really big lens. I mean, uh, you can't get <laughs> close to where she is in that tree because, uh, you know, she's way up there. So that's a big lens. But it is, it is funny. The, uh, you're in a vehicle and a, a, a lion or a leopard views you and the vehicle as one being. Right. So there might be eight of you or two of you in the, in the truck, but they don't see you as separate things. Now, and this is very true in the case of the, the Cape buffalo, which is a very, very dangerous animal. If you got out of the vehicle, whoa, they're going to come and grind you into dust. If you stay in the vehicle, you're just one of them and nothing, nothing to see here. Mm -hmm. it, it is a little discomforting, I'm told, I've never had the experience, that if a family brings small children and they bring them in the vehicle with it, the lions especially will pick out the little kids and be eyeballing them, mm -hmm. thinking, well, maybe I can make a meal out of that, which is, you know... <laughs> 
enough to make everybody really uncomfortable. So don't take small kids on safari. So how close in a vehicle or not have you gotten to a lion? The first night in Mala Mala um, that we saw those two, uh, not the two I showed because I don't have pictures of those unhappily. Uh, you could have, we were sitting in an open vehicle like the two of us right here. You could literally have reached out and petted them. Because oh they literally went right by the open, and there's not a, even a door. It was a cutout. So you could literally have put your hand out and petted him on the head. Could you literally have touched the top of the lion's head? H- had you done that, you yeah. would have gotten your head, hand taken Whack. off. Uh-huh. But, you know, he would have turned her head and dragged you right out of the vehicle, and then you would have been, you would have been dinner. They wouldn't have had to find the white hog, the uh-huh. word hog. Uh-huh. Uh, but um, obviously you don't want to do that. You don't yeah, want to yeah. break that obviously. plane that they view as the difference between, you know, a, a you know, big piece of metal and a meal. <laughs> yeah. So now, how, you mentioned these, um, when you're, when the in trucks, how often are you on roads? How often are you completely off-road when you're riding around? These, well, it's interesting. You can do your own um, safari in the Kruger National Park or in the, in the Mar- Masamara. Uh, there are paved roads in these places, Atosha and... Uh, the Namib and a bunch of these other places you can rent a vehicle and go try and find something yourself. Now, uh, you don't have the eyesight, with all due respect. Um, if you were smart enough to look up in the air and see a bunch of vultures circling, you might think that it would be worth going over there to see who's, who's eating. Uh, that's, uh, that's what these guys do a lot. Um, or if you see a tree full of these birds, you know, looking very ominous, that's usually they're sitting over uh, somebody who's eating. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're not clever enough to do that, a lot of the Masyamara, for instance, the rules are you have to stay on the road. Mm-hmm. You cannot leave the road. <clears throat> a lot of these um, uh, private reserves, uh, which you find in Botswana and, and Namibia and... Um, in Southern Africa, they, there are off-road vehicles, and you'd go off into the bush looking for something. But they're all, you know, two-tire dirt tracks, so that you'd be bombing around on those most of the time. But you'd go off uh, into the bush to track something that the that the guide had seen, or to get you closer to something. Or if you see a herd of elephant over in a group of trees, you might, you know, or uh, giraffe, same thing. You might go over to have a closer look and get off the road. But if you were to do the self-drive of, in Kruger, for instance, it's not allowed to get off the road. You have to stay on the road itself. Now, they have a quite a network of roads, but, I mean, you might be a long, long way from something. Fuel, gas stations. All, it's all diesel fuel, and you don't sense that uh, in that uh, the truck comes before dark every morning, and, and it's they've done it all, and... And done that. If you're going to try to self-do it, uh, that's worth planning. You really need to know where the next station's going to be and all that sort of thing. That's uh, much more problematic. Luckily for me, Kim isn't into do-it-yourself. Um, she's h- happy to pay the premium involved, <laughs> and I'm happy to carry the bags. So, <laughs> so in zoos, we look at lions, and their coat looks... You know, a little, not as nice as our house cat. What does the coat look like in the wild? So there, well, there's a couple of things going on. Um, in the wild, the prey animals know their prey, and they are really keeping a lookout, using their senses to stay out of harm's way and out of the lion's mouth, if you will. So they're way more diligent about paying attention to where they are. They will lightly graze something, looking up all the time. Where uh, I mean, we have this wonderful video about uh, wolves being reintroduced to Yellowstone. Wolves cause the ruminant animals, the antelopes, to not overgraze because a wolf is going to catch you if you are not paying attention. So they graze lightly and keep moving. So the riverbanks stay in place because they don't overgraze the, bu- the, the shrubbery, which is what's holding the riverbank in place. So these natural things are all interacting in some very complex ways. Now, the ranchers are not happy that the wolves are back for good reason because they take their sheep and such. But 
um, you know, the topography of Yellowstone has reverted to what it used to be. You don't get the flooding they used to have because the riverbanks stay in place, etc. So on to the predators. The predators all have to kill to eat. If they don't eat, they starve. If they get a little old, a little slow, they're not going to catch something. Maybe they're bigger, they can run another prey animal off something that has been killed, but you know, scavenging only works up to a point, and they age a lot faster. That lion that you're looking at at the, Saint Fran at the San Francisco Zoo uh, might be, uh, you know, well into his teens, where you wouldn't find a lion that was more than, say, 12 years old, only rarely, because they got to fight to eat. Even with the family members, there's no manners around the table. Nobody says, come on in, Grandma, you know, it's your turn. Um, so they get a fight every day for everything. The other fu funny thing about the, com you know, being on the predator's side is they're on straight commission. <laughs> so <laughs> if they don't sell, they don't eat. So is cannibalism among the animals? Uh, it, funny you should ask that. So I mentioned that the cheetah really have to keep a lookout because the, uh, the um, hyenas or the lions or the leopards will take them. Kill them. They won't eat them. What they're doing is removing competition. Next meal, if that cheetah took it instead of me, that's one meal less for me. So they'll kill another predator for that reason. But they won't eat them. I mean, they, I, apparently they don't like what they taste like or some such thing. I, I don't know, Wagyu beef instead of... Uh, <laughs> they're, they're far more, uh, you know... Discerning pallets, I suppose. What kind of damage do the Jeeps do when you drive around off the road? Um, can, the, most of the pictures you saw of Southern Africa, uh, we go in their winter, our summer, uh, because the bug populations are way lower. It could be quite cold in the morning. It might be some frost around in small localities, but you might be mid to low 40s uh, during the ends of the day. And in the middle of the day, it might be 75, 80 degrees in the sunshine in the broad open plains. But um, the, the denseness of the brush is not thick, so you can see the animals. During their summer, when it rains, the, dense, the brush can be very dense. It's hard to see the animals with a lot of greenery around. Uh, the bug population is way up, and I hate bugs. Um, so... If you were to take an off-road vehicle and drive through, um, you know, the bush to get something, um, since we're there during the winter, you're not killing anything because everything's pretty much dead anyway. Um, but next summer, that's all going to grow right back, and you won't notice it. It's, it's funny. The, the landscape architect of Africa is an elephant, and for no particular reason, they'll just walk up to a tree and knock it over. Uh, what's going on? Don't know. So which animals can you get closer to and not close? It sounds like you can get closer to some of the predators because they're not as afraid. You can't get close to... Uh, uh, and talk about those, in, those deer. In most of the, uh, in the... In these game parks and the farms that have yeah. turned into game reserves, um, all of the animals are becoming are, or are habituated to how these jeeps are going to act. Uh, they don't do a lot of, they, they, do, they go to great lengths to make sure that what's being done is predictable. So the animals get used to certain behaviors, which allow you to get a lot closer to elephants, for instance, than might be uh, reasonable to do in a place where the elephants were not habituated to you. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, South Africa, not so much now, but... Uh, not so long ago, there was still hunting going on in Botswana, and there still is some hunting going on in Botswana, but in areas where the hunting stopped 20, 30, 40 years ago, you can get close to elephants now. How close? When we first went to, to uh, Botswana, you wouldn't see elephants because they'd hear the vehicle and scram, and they're huge beasts, but they can move really fast and really quietly, and you wouldn't even know they were close. It's, a, it's amazing. Now, 
you saw those couple of pictures, you can actually see the, the bumper on the, on the Jeep and the animal's right there. Like 10 feet away? Oh, yeah. An elephant, yeah. 10 now, feet away. these guides are very well attuned to how the animal's behaving. If you're in a herd of elephants, it's run by the, the grandma is running things. Grandma's got the institutional memory about where the water is and that when it gets dry, where we go and all that sort of thing. And so the whole family really pays attention to how she's feeling about things. If uh, she starts flapping her ears at you and, you know, tromping around, it's probably because there's a, some little ones around that you're in the wrong place, so you need to back up, get out of there. Um, what you would not do is go to a... If you were to see a really large bull alone, is the, the girls kick the guys out. They get too grumpy and they're obstreperous and they step on the little ones and you know, it's just not, they don't behave very well. So they get tossed out. So you'll find a big old guy by himself. Well, you probably want to give him plenty of room. He probably doesn't see so well anymore. And, you know, like us, he's getting grumpy. So you give him plenty of room, and that's, that's wise. Primates. How often do you see, when have you seen primates? Uh, Kim is dying to go to Rwanda and, you know, and, and sit amongst the apes, the mountain gorillas. Um, you, do you mean actually sit among them like yes, we are right now? Yes. I feel relatively safe sitting next well, to you. Well, that's, that's right. That's right, because you but, haven't tried to take my food, so I'm good. But, but how close can you get to, you know... Apparently, you know, they, these camps have found these families, and they've habituated them to the presence of humans, and so you can get right in close. There's a whole series of behaviors that you have to learn. I mean, you have to be very differential of a big male. Yes. And that sort of thing. You don't look them in the eye and you don't stare at them overly long and you don't stare at the little ones and all that sort of stuff. But there are behaviors that will get you through. Um, and th the same is true of each and every one of these different animal species. There are things that you do and things you don't do that you, know, you learn after a while. Um, or that these guys are very tuned into and will keep you tuned into. Because uh, the first thing they will tell you is that you don't get out of the truck. Don't stand up suddenly. Don't, you know, and all that sort of thing. And, you know, it's just pretty obvious why you shouldn't stand up after. <laughs> you're, you're sitting amongst a pride of lions and they're kind of not paying much attention to you. A sudden move might not actually be in your best interest. <laughs> We're visiting at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon today with Chris Ray, noted photographer and frequent visitor to Africa. He's just back from his most recent trip with his wife, Kim. In their three-week trips, uh, they come back with thousands of photographs, and it's wonderful to be looking at them. When, you're, when you come back from one of these trips, is there like a little decompression exercise that you go through? Do you guys like to stop in... Uh, Important yeah. to have a vacation from the vacation. So that's usually a beach resort or something like that that's totally different. South Africa offers a wide range of different things you can do. Uh, Hermanos at the right time would be great whale watching, for instance, uh, or wine country, or you know, just find a lovely, luxurious hotel and hunker down for a little while. That's lots of different things to do. So if you're going to recommend to somebody who has not before been to Africa... Uh, and you were to say, okay, here's your three-week trip. What are the choices you'd give them? Tell, where would you tell them to go on their three-week trip? Well, I, I, a lot of people don't understand uh, that Africa's a, a huge continent. It's a very big place. People were worried about Ebola, for instance. Um, the distance from where you're going to be in southern Africa to Ebola is... F that distance is greater than... F from here to New York. That's how big the place is. It's big. So people think they can go to Southern Africa and Eastern Africa in the same trip. Well, that'd be really hard without private jets. Um, with a private jet, you could do it, but that tends to be a little on the expensive side. So you have to pick. Do you want the migration and all the stuff attendant with that, which is awesome, the big wide open planes and and all of that that you'd get in Tanzania and Kenya? Or do you want a more intimate experience with the smaller farms um, with, and, and get the, all of the big five, uh, which means Southern Africa? Uh, you can put 
um, South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Mozambique, um, together in one trip, you can actually hit some number of those quite reasonably because the distances are fairly close. And all of these nice camps have either their own airstrip or something close enough to where they can arrange um, a charter from here to the next place. And uh, Maun in, uh, in Botswana is the sort of the local feeder airport, if you will. So you can get yourself back to Maun and, and from there fly in a commercial to, uh, you know, to, so to Southern Africa, Joburg or, uh, or Cape Town, for instance. So earlier we were talking about how close you can get to some of the dangerous predators. Describe a scary experience when you actually got scared, when you thought this is dangerous. Um, we had a uh, we had a, a, a funny in retrospect um, occurrence happen in a place called Pinda, which is in southern Africa, which is a an interesting farm with a a kid and a a, a guide who were not used to each other. Now, in this particular place and in a number of places, there's a chair at the end of the the hood on the vehicle, so he's sitting out right out the, at the front bumper. So if we were to come upon some cats, he'd, he'd come around and sit in the back. He wouldn't be that, uh, that tempting, you know, and that separates him from the vehicle being out in a chair at the, you know, mm -hmm. in the front. So we come on a middling size male elephant, and there is a tall. Group, How tall is middling size? Uh, uh, ceiling height. Mm -hmm. So in That's the top of his head, the top of the ceiling? Yeah. So like, we're in a vehicle like sitting 12, at 12, 11 feet up. Yeah. Okay. So we're in a vehicle looking at this, and he's that tall. Um, and our, our tracker is still in the chair. And the guide gets a little too close to this thing. And this guy you know, gives us that little head up, starts wiggling his ears and approaching. At which point, you can see you're, <laughs> you're watching the guide. You kind of have to watch me do this. He, the, the tracker's going like this. <laughs> like, right. I don't know what he's getting ready, what he's going to do. Right. And it, finally, and I, th and I, you know, you just don't know, but intuiting, I, this happened to be a white driver and a black tracker. These days it's mostly both black guys because they're villagers now. But back then, this was a white, a young white guy and a, a black tracker. And I don't know what was going on there. There might have been something going on. But finally, the tracker looks over his shoulder at the driver. And at this point, the driver finally gets it and turns the car on and starts backing off. Now, that was... You don't think they were settling that was scores? That was, there may have been a, a little dominance thing going on in the truck. <laughs> I'm not sure of that. These are the animals in the truck we're he talking was, about. He was, exactly. That's right. Would, I think that uh, the driver was trying to, you know, Tell the tracker who was boss. I, um, maybe you know. So I don't know. That was odd. And another time, every one of these camps, um, your the central lodge is one place, and your rooms are out and away from the lodge. And any decent lodge will not let you go after dark by yourself or with from the lodge the back people. out to your right, camp. back to your camp. So your cabin, I guess you will be walking out there with someone. They will send one of the, even the kids um, will accompany you. So they want you to wait here until this guy comes and he'll have a flashlight so you can see where, you know, where to put your feet kind of thing. You might have your own flashlight also, but he's also so tuned into what's going on around that, um, that you're not gonna get in any trouble. That was true every single time this has happened, with one exception. We're at a place called, uh, uh, the name has gone out of my head, maybe it'll pop back and maybe it won't. Um, but we're in, in Botswana, and this place is a, we're the farthest um, camp away from the lodge, and there's, they have a little boardwalk that goes all the way to the camp, and we've got a kid with us. And we're walking along, and Kim... A kid, a young child. Yeah, uh, not a young child, but a, a, the guy who's there to keep us from running into problems. He's not a guide, but, he, you know, he's one of the, he's one of the guys who would... Uh, he's an attendant. That's okay. a great way to put it. He might have been clearing dishes or How something old? like that. How uh, old? 14. 
15. Anyway, we come on three Cape buffalo that are just minding their own business and grazing. I'm going, oh, oh, oh. This is no bueno. Now, we for our audience, want to be, Cape buffalo is how big? They're here to the. They're here to these high tops. So and they're twenty uh, feet away. Uh, these are the size of a horse, are, half the size of a horse. Oh, big cow! This is bull size. These guys are big. You know, right. and they're just happily munching away. Right. You know, the kid starts freaking out, and so we're on this boardwalk, no fence or anything like that. Yeah. And uh, at this point, I know they've heard us. They're, if they were going to be interested in us, they would have already started showing that. But they're just happily munching away. And so I make an executive decision, which may have been completely wrong. But I kept speaking in the voice I was speaking in, not louder or softer. And I said, let's just keep going quietly. And we kept talking so that nothing would change. So nothing would, so whatever was going on, they wouldn't sense a change, because I didn't want them to look up and decide they needed to do something about right. us. So apparently we were just far enough away, they'd heard us coming soon enough, or whatever, but we walked by, <laughs> Kim gets to the door and she goes, can you believe that we were right on the <laughs> Yes, dear, we, we lived, it's okay. So what's, in all your trips out there, what's the most beautiful animal? If you were to say, what is really beautiful? Uh, what animals? There are there are a lot of different answers to that question. We yeah. just uh, there were 140 or so slides in that presentation, and the hard and fast rule is never more than 70. So you know I gave you twice as many, and the in the twice as many there wasn't a single bird. Uh, I could have given you another 140 birds without any problem whatsoever, and it's a shame. But the birds are glorious in Africa. I'm not a birder, but it might turn you into one. But if you wanted to narrow me down to the most beautiful animal, the leopards are solitary, and when you're lucky enough to find one, um, she's, you know, possibly in a tree or something like that. There are, they are beautiful animals to behold. And it's uh, wonderful. But, you know, it's, once again, it's like picking between your kids. You know, it's, uh, so many of them are, have so many wonderful things about them. How close have you gotten to alligators? Um, in a truck, you got no problems with a Nile crocodile. Um, How close? Uh, so from here to, to uh, our... Ten feet? Our wonderful, yeah. Ten yeah feet. You don't want to be ten feet on foot. But 10 feet in a vehicle, you're all right. Are cabins in the brush safer than tents? Is there any difference? I don't think there's a difference. Strangely enough, uh, while a, a lion could take, come, come through that canvas tent in one second flat, for some reason they don't. If the door was open, that'd be a different story. But just a zipper door, you know, you, you might as well be up in a tree or on another planet. Um, you know, now... The missus might feel differently about that and want to have, a, you know, a, a solid uh, room around her with doors and, and windows and such. But And you're always, are you usually almost always traveling in the daytime? Don't travel yeah, at oh night? Yeah, yeah. Travel in the daytime. Yeah. Most of the parks uh, have rules about you can't be in the park after dark. Um, especially the Mara and the Serengeti, you can't be driving around after dark. Snakes. They, plenty of them. We didn't see any. How often do you see it? I saw that one that the honey badger ate right in front of us. That was something. And uh, how big a snake? Was Southern that? and Eastern Africa have some pretty nasty characters. The black mambo is uh, the the worst of them. Um, you know, the, these are very venomous, nasty characters. They've got a range of cobras as well. Uh, luckily, I've only seen a handful of snakes in the whole time. That I've, you know, all the times we've gone to Africa, and we don't do a lot of walking around in the bush, so, and that'd be when you'd, you'd probably encounter them. Now, you've mentioned the bush, and we saw the sort of savanna looking, uh, you know, terrain. What about raw, true jungle, deep, dense jungle, like Brazilian jungle? Talk about, have you been to the African jungle well, part, and where well, would that be? Now you're, now you're thinking about Tarzan movies and yeah, that's uh, why I'm Equatorial asking. Africa and, uh, <laughs> you know, and the kookaburra, which is hilariously an Australian bird that, that makes that, oh, 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 
phone noise. That's a, that isn't that, that isn't in Africa. But uh, so haven't you swung from so a you branch? Know, right, exactly. Well, I've done that, but not. But that was the bar here. <laughs> um, no, uh, I haven't been in any trips where they're wielding machetes and uh, you know, and with the uh, ape men uh, swinging through the trees. Dense jungle. Where would that be? Well, I, now you're talking about rainforests. Um, you could find that in Brazil if you wanted. There's uh, but some in of Africa. It, there's some of it in Australia if you want. Um, there's, uh, as I said, plenty in South America. Um, in Africa, you're talking about Western Africa now, for the most part. Um, the mountain gorillas, that Rwanda area is quite thick, I understand. I haven't been there, but, um, you know, that's very deep foliage. And, and uh, in large part, that mountain gorilla is shy, so, you know, they would tend to stay in places with really thick cover like that. Um, and they eat uh, a lot of... Uh, leaves and that sort of stuff, fruits that they would find in those kind of dense environments. But, you know, you're there to see animals, and dense uh, foliage keeps you from seeing animals. So, you know, we tend to, to favor open plains or at least uh, winter conditions when the brush isn't so thick so you can actually see them. Otherwise, you'd spend a lot of time driving around seeing nothing. So, so when are you going to go back? Next summer. Next summer. Oh, yeah. She's already... She's already getting up. organized. Oh, can't wait. Be great. Chris, it's always so fun that you come and share your work with us. It's really great. We've been... Uh, today at the Windsor Yachting Luncheon, our guest has been Chris Ray, noted photographer and uh, contributor to our Yacht Club. Welcome very much, Chris, back to, us, to San Francisco. Terrific. Thank, Thank you, me, Ron. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. And with that, the luncheon is adjourned.